my name is Mark Coleman. I am the president and uh, founder of the Tactile Group. We are a digital agency, like she said, uh, located about three blocks from here. Uh, we concentrate on civic work whose goal at the end of the day is to improve the lives of all people. So we like to say we're designed to give a damn. So. Um, I'd like to get a, a sense of who's in the room just by show of hands. Um, who here works at an independent agency or, or firm? Okay, good. Uh, how many of you work uh, on um, in-house uh, uh, sections of large organizations? Okay, good to know. Uh, how many of you are uh, freelancers or solopreneurs? I think it's equal balance of all of you. Now, here's a really interesting question. How many of you um, are responsible for hiring decisions at your organization? OK, all you freelancers, you're welcome. Those are the people you need to talk to after this presentation. Um, so uh, let's get started. I want to, now that I know a little bit more about you, uh, I wanted to let you know a little bit more about me and my background through the telling of a little story. So uh, earlier in my life, um, I did a four-year bid over in New Jersey at a little institution called Princeton University. And uh, when we were in my sophomore year, uh, I received in my campus mailbox, yes, pre-email, uh, an invitation to attend a reception at the uh, President's House um, uh, for, they were just welcoming incoming students or uh, sophomore students. I was like gossmack, it's like, great, I get to meet the President, and it was only gonna be, be about a dozen of us. So I, I walk into the room for, at this reception at the Palmer House, and uh, like I expected, there were a, a dozen or so colleagues of mine, or classmates of mine in the room. And at Princeton at that time, it was about as diverse as it was, so um, that meant I was the only African-American male in the room. Uh, and, uh, but other than that, the, the room itself was diverse in that I was there, there were uh, people of different genders, there were people from different parts of the country. Some of us slumbered in the Hamptons, some of us were scrubbing dishes to get through school. So there was a diversity of on different aspects uh, of people in that room. At the proper time in the afternoon or in the evening, uh, we were uh, kind of put into a line, a receiving line to greet the guest of honor who was the mayor of uh, Princeton Township, um, which surrounds uh, the, uh, is the, is where the university is actually located. Um, this is a well-heeled woman of a certain age with a perfect manicure and a matching Chanel, Chanel suit. Uh, she also had a jaunty eye patch over one eye, which I thought was kind of piratey cool. But um, So she goes down the line and uh, kind of greets everyone with little inning questions about where you're from, how much do you love Princeton, it's a wonderful place, thank you, goodbye. When she gets to me, the only African-American male in the room, um, she asks the same inane questions, but she leaves with a parting shot, which has kind of stuck to me to this day. Uh, she said, I'm so glad that you're, uh, you're here today because you get to see how the other half lives. So, you know, I'm in the room, but I'm not included. You know, I'm, I'm in this diverse space, quote, as much as the person could be at the time, but I'm still on the outside. So I decided that and a couple other experiences that uh, are too lengthy to go into that I w didn't want to ever feel like that again. I, uh, I made a space for myself in which I would always feel included, always feel valued, um, mostly by being a solo entrepreneur. Uh, I had a, spent a long time as a DJ. Uh, I, I ran a bed at breakfast, if you can believe it, uh, for, for a while. If anybody ever tells you you want to go into bed at breakfast business, go screaming in the other direction. It's not a good idea. It's not fun. Um, so um, in trying to create a, a safe space for myself, and um, fast forward to 2004 when I started the Tactile Group, and as we've grown to be 16 to 25 people, I wanted to make sure that, that the space we were creating in Tactile was safe and inclusive for all people. Um, so that kind of dovetails into our talk today. I would like to talk to you today about uh, diversity in specific, uh, specifically the value of diversity on design teams, how to build a diverse uh, team, and what a diverse team needs to thrive. Let's start with the definition. Uh, at the, its most basic, it's a pretty straightforward concept, right? Diversity can be defined as the condition of having or being composed of different elements. So if we look at the population of the world, we, as a population, are diverse. We, um, we in this room even, come from different backgrounds, from different ethnicities. We represent different gender, gender identities, gender, gender expressions, um, different ages, different immigrant statuses, different religious beliefs. Um, and as designers, developers, and creative teams, you know, if we think of them as a subset of the general population, you know, th these type of teams should be no different. But what often happens is many design teams are really uh, 
homogeneous. So why is that? Well, my, 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 uh, my concept is really that the familiar is easy. Uh, our peer groups are often influenced by socioeconomic factors drawn along lines of class, race, gender, ethnicity, gender identity, and sexual expression. Um, it's easier to work with and to hire people who are like us. Intuitively, this makes sense, right? So um, a homogeneous team, um, on a homogeneous team, people are more likely to understand each other really quickly and collaboration seems to flow smoother and um, it gives a sense of quick progress. Um, dealing with outsiders or people with different opinions or different backgrounds may seem to cause friction. But as I'm about to show, uh, it's that the diversity of perspectives uh, that's baked into a team that's diverse that makes, um, the value, makes that team so valuable. So in, in trying to assess the value of a diverse team, let's just go right to a few inter interesting scientific studies uh, that have come up recently. Uh, diverse teams tend to uh, focus more on facts. In a study published in the Journal of Personality uh, and Social Psychology, scientists assigned 200 people to six-person mock jury panels whose members were either all white or included four white and two black participants. The people were shown a video of a trial of a black defendant and white victims. They had uh, to decide whether to, def uh, then they had to decide whether the defendant was guilty. It turned out that the diverse panels raised more facts related to the case than hom homogeneous panels uh, and fewer factual, and they made fewer factual errors while discussing the available evidence. If errors did occur, they were more likely to be corrected during deliberation. One possible reason for this difference was that the white jurors on diverse panels recalled evidence more accurately. Diverse teams are more likely to um, constantly re-examine the facts and remain objective. They may also encourage greater scrutiny from, each, um, e from, e from other members' actions, keeping their joint cognitive resources sharp and vigilant. Diverse teams also tend to be more innovative. In a study published in the uh, Economic Geography, uh, the authors concluded that the increased cultural diver diversity is a boon to uh, innovativeness. They pulled data of 7,615 firms that participated in the London Annual Business Survey, a question conducted with the UK Capital's ex uh, executives that asked a number of questions about their company's performance. The results re revealed that businesses run by culturally diverse leadership teams were more likely to develop new products than those with um, homogeneous uh, leadership. So though you feel like uh, more at ease working with people who you share background, don't be fooled by your comfort. Working with individuals who do not look talk or think like you can allow you to dodge the costly pitfalls of conformity which discourages innovative thinking. So pushing yourself outside of your comfort zone will make you better at whatever you do. Another thing to consider is um, diverse teams have built in focus groups. I'm sure many of you in the room have um, gone through the process of building use, uh, user scenarios and uh, user personas. Um, we found in our team, since we have such a diverse team, um, it's much easier to build those cases when someone on the team has personal uh, experience in, in the type of user case you're trying to build. Um, you're more likely to get what, you're, what, you, uh, what a user group needs if someone on your team has shared direct personal experience. Um, and this is becoming much more important as technology is pushing us toward a global economy. When our, uh, when our design teams can understand uh, a larger swath of the, of the world and the uh, end user, you're going to have a speedier uh, development process. But finally, diverse teams yield better results. Um, I want to point to a study by Richard Freeman. Uh, he's an uh, economist at Harvard University. <coughs> he recently did a study on, on diversity, um, how diversity impacts research teams, uh, diversity on research teams um, impacting their, uh, I'm sorry, how does uh, diversity on research teams improve quality of science? Uh, he used uh, uh, the citation method uh, to look at 1.5 million papers um, delivered between 1985 and 2008. Basically, the citation me method uh, states that the more times uh, a, a, a article or a political paper or scientific paper is cited by another uh, journal, the more important it is, the more valuable it is. Uh, when he compared uh, the number of citations the papers received uh, when they were written by diverse teams compared to when the authors came from a single similar background, uh, they found that uh, when you write a paper largely with people of your own group, it's likely that the paper gets less citations than if you write a broader, for a gr broader group of people. Um, so in dealing with more than a million papers, uh, the link seems pretty clear. Uh, if you have a more diverse, uh, you get a better research paper. What's interesting was that this seemed to affect all groups. So papers 
written exclusively by Anglo authors don't do as well as papers that had, um, have Anglo authors and, let's say, Chinese authors. Uh, but that's not because the Chinese authors are always make, make the papers better. If you look at the papers that were written exclusively by Chinese authors, those papers tended also not to be as good as papers that were written by diverse teams. Ethnic diversity is an indicator of idea diversity. People who are uh, more alike are more inclined to um, think alike. And uh, one of the things that gives science a kick is when you get uh, people coming at a problem from somewhat different views. So n that's the value of a uh, diverse team. But uh, in order to create an environment in which an, a diverse team can actually thrive, you have to have a couple of things in place. And uh, we've learned this over the 16 years, 12 years, 12 years that the tactile has been around uh, the hard way. You know, we, um, we have just really kind of gotten it all together. This is the team that uh, the inclusion of diversity has built. It's taken years to get here. Um, after a few missteps and course corrections, our culture, our process, and our work has gelled in a magnificently symbiotic way. We have just found our voice as a company. So this is what we've kind of learned um, in building this diverse team. So at the base, um, we have to have had a culture of inclusion. Uh, a diverse team can only be su successful in an organization that has a culture of inclusion, that has to be baked into the organization. It has to come from the executive level. It has to come through policy, and it has to be enforced. Uh, and I want to make a very important distinction here. Diversity is not inclusion. Uh, remember the story I told you at the beginning of this about uh, my time at uh, this reception at Princeton? Um, that room was diverse, but I was not included. I was in the room, but not at the table. Uh, so it's just because you're in the room doesn't mean you're at the table. Um, and according to a recent Deloitte study, uh, millennials think of diversity and inclusion as valuing open participation by employees with different perspectives and personalities. Uh, diversity without inclusion is just a bunch of differently hued people sitting in a room. You have the possibility of, of friction without the promise of progress. In order for these, you know, these diverse people to actually work uh, coll collaboratively and collectively together, there has to be a, a, a kind of underlying sense of empathy. Um, this is respect 101. It's not that everybody in the um, in the organization is going to be BFS forever, but there um, there has to be a basic level of respect. Uh, to quote a colleague, uh, Talia Emmitson from Revzilla, nobody wants to work with a brilliant jerk. So uh, when you're working with people who don't look like you, or have the same background, or weren't born in the same decade, or come from the same part of the world, someone in your group will have been made to feel other at some time in their life. Someone in that group is going to will have experienced some sort of institutionalized oppression, whether it be racism, sexism, homophobia, ageism, whatever. So myself, as a cisgendered, gay, black man, and a uh, interracial, intergenerational relationship. I see all these things on a daily basis in various forms and in different ways. Um, so the next step, it's important to have an understanding of the next concept, even though it's really kind of too broad for this talk. Um, and that's the concept of intersectionality. Um, basically, it states that all of these kind of systems are interconnected, uh, um, and they're based in the same, uh, all the isms and phobias are, uh, that separate us are born out of the same system of oppression. Uh, of one group's belief that they are inherently superior to another. Um, so intersectionality kind of challenges us, and what my take on it for the purposes of this talk, um, what it challenges us to do to look at uh, the challenges all of us personally face in our own lives and see how they overlap with those of their peers. Our peers, they won't be the same, but there's, they, they, there's a commonality in all these systems of oppression. Um, for a really kind of uh, deeper dive into this, I suggest reading uh, Audre Lord. She did a really short, uh, Pointed uh, 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 essay on uh, called "There Is No Hierarchy of Oppressions," and I have links to that at the end of these slides. So intersectionality is like the graduate level. Uh, understanding intersectionality is the kind of like graduate level, but every company has to have em empathy in order for a diverse team to work. So that's the the environment that a diverse team needs to have. But how do you actually build a diverse team? Um, I would challenge everyone, who, especially the people who raise their hands last, uh, who are involved in the hiring process, to make um, hiring, making, building diverse teams a priority. By breaking up workplace hom homogeneity, you can allow your team members to become more aware of their own potential biases and entrench ways of thinking that can otherwise blind them to key information and even lead them to make errors in decision-making process. So in order to actually you know, build a diverse team, you have to value, value diversity in the hiring process. What worked for us um, is that we actually um, are lucky enough to get a lot of 
uh, applicants every time we get uh, submit an, have an opening at the, at the company. So everyone we consider has the skills for the job. There is no dumbing down or lowering the, the bar here. Everyone has to have the skills at base. Everyone we consider has to show signs of being able to work on, on our team that respects one another. They have to show empathy. They have to have, be a good cultural fit. But when it gets down to the final decision, and, uh, and after all other valuation uh, criteria have been considered, we make the offer to the candidate that brings uh, a different set of experience than we currently have, someone that will help us think uh, of things and approach problems in a different way. And for us, having a very different first team already, sometimes that's a cisgender straight white man, which is rare in this industry. Um, the second uh, thing that you really have to do when you build a diverse team is not to tolerate intolerance. Um, a, a culture of inclusion requires constant care and feeding. Um, bias training and sexual harassment training, these should all be kind of baked in. And, and when these kind of conflicts invariably um, happen, you have to address them openly, transparently, and immediately. Um, everyone has to know that their skills are embraced, that they're, that they're valued and included, or, and um, lack of empathy has to be addressed, or else a diverse team will fly apart. And uh, lastly, you know, once you have, have put the effort in uh, to build a diverse team, or you need to, you really want to uh, build a diverse team, you really need to promote the hell out of it, whether it's up the chain to management to uh, help them understand what's necessary of an uh, inclusive uh, culture, or whether it's you know, letting the people, um, candidates know and in the world know uh, that your, your company values uh, diversity and inclusion. And I'm not just talking about having Taco Tuesday. I mean, in a real su substantive way, there has to be um, uh, a way that you, sh you promote the fact that your company is, uh, is values the inclusion of all people's opinions. So in conclusion, I'll leave you with this. Uh, the friction of diverse perspectives can spark magic. It's uh, scientifically proven that uh, diverse teams produce better results, they're more innovative, and ultimately more profitable. Um, diverse teams are also not easy to build, but they're definitely worth the investment. So that's my talk. Thanks. OK, any questions? Oh, well, I, record time. Hi. Um, as an immigrant, I'm also part of a diverse team, even though I think I'm probably the only person who is not an American in the company. Um, my question is, though, it's not related to this, but as I understand, you work a lot with companies that, like you said, weren't give a damn um, or you know, give a damn about something. So I guess they are nonprofits, correct? Sure. No, um, not, all, not all. Not not all, but. When you're working with nonprofits, like what is your experience usually with them? Because when we work with nonprofits, they're usually more harder to work with because they may not have a budget that they, you know, other companies might have or the uh, organizations. And sometimes we just disconnect a lot with those companies because they're something we're not used to. So I, I just want to hear what is like your experience working with them. Well, um, we. There are challenges in working with non nonprofits, and usually they don't have a larger budget. We, we, um, if that's what you're you're, you're getting yeah. at, um, we kind of balance that by doing civic and government work. So, um, the, and some commercial work as well. We don't exclusively work with nonprofits. So, it, but uh, every project we take on is culturally or, or mission aligned with our, our business. There's certain projects we won't do in the federal government. There's certain companies we won't work with. Um, but the, the larger, um, more established organizations allows us to take the kind of more kind of heartfelt nonprofit things, which aren't generally not as, not as profitable. So we, we balance the, um, the money issue by taking larger and more diverse kind of clients. Okay. okay. Great. Thank you. Sure. Hi. Hey there. Um, what are some examples of um, some more ways that companies can incorporate the inclusion part on their teams? Well, it depends on the size of the organization. I mean, it, it's kind of difficult to. Um, uh, in a really large organization, everything moves slowly, right? So uh, I think you have to really push the, the, the economic value of a diverse team in order to um, uh, make it uh, 
a valuable shift in priorities for large organizations. For a smaller organization, especially when the ones that are kind of personality driven, um, it has to come from the executive. You have to you have to convince the person at the top that it's it's good for their business, um, and then under, help them understand what uh, some of these tips. That, uh, please share these tips on how to um, make a, a, an environment that's conducive and safe for a, a diverse team. Hi. Uh, could you share some examples of times when having a really diverse team has um, maybe saved you or um, made something really better that you weren't expecting? Okay, so um, we were um, doing initial kind of internal review uh, for a, a, some a project that we were working on, and um, one of our um, it was kind of really really tight and uh, had these really kind of gorgeous font treatments and. Um, before we even took it out to user testing, our, 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 um, our project manager, who's 62 years old, she's like, I can't read that. I was like, oh, okay, so we need to really rethink this for um, people with different, different sight abilities. And that, that was early in our, our process, so we've adjusted um, our entire process to really look at, how, uh, look at that earlier. Hi, thank you very much for the talk. I was sure. wondering if you had any suggestions for things that companies can do to uh, broaden their uh, pool of applicants and to make themselves uh, be a more uh, comfortable and, and feel like a more safe place to apply for candidates that might not necessarily identify with the people that are there already. Sure. It's, it's one of those chicken and egg things, right? I mean, uh, we, we're in the situation where diverse candidates find us because they know that we, we have that kind of space and that, um, that they will be, be valued there. Um, for a company that's looking to transition to that, they, it, that messaging, messaging is really difficult, but it, um, and I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling with like really good ways for companies to shift towards that. Um, so I, I would suggest just uh, really um, talking to management, um, helping them understand the value of it, um, have internal discussions about it, um, and you know it's 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 difficult. I think it's you really have to um, promote the fact that your, your place is inclusive. It has to actually be inclusive for people to to to, to gravitate towards you. I mean, uh, the diverse candidates are are not as populous. You know, we we know that it's it's a it's a smaller uh, pool. But if you kind of really promote the fact that you're actively uh, seeking diversity in your in your solutions and in on on your team, um, it, it, people tend to find you. Um, but you really have to be active about it. Hi, thanks for speaking today. Sure. Um, so I have a question a little bit more about retention sure. than, than hiring because I mean one thing I've noticed especially is you know being a developer of color is that you know places will seek you out uh, and in order to make their workplaces more diverse. Um, and so in, in addition to hiring um, you know a diverse group of candidates, how do you uh, think the best way is to retain some of those people? And what do you think the challenges are in uh, you know, maintaining, you know, not just getting someone at the table or at the desk, but you know, keeping them there for, a, for enough time? Yeah, I think that goes back to my point about the culture of inclusion. If the, the organization you know, just wants to get you in the door, but they're not really, there's not a, a kind of base level empathy throughout the organization, um, and there's not a celebration of, of the diversity that you bring to the table, um, and you're, there's no act, it, it takes constant care and feeding. You can't just bring somebody in the door and, and hope they'll be fine. You have to um, address the issues that they're having and, and, and understand that there are specific issues that diverse candidates are going to have that you know, non-diverse candidates won't. Um, but find, find commonality in that. I, I, and I really think that has to come from the, the top. There has to be a culture that really um, makes people want to work together and solve problems together actively. Uh, and not just one who, not just one where people just come to work every day. Um, again, you know, not everybody's going to be best friends, but you have to uh, really understand each other's perspective and value it. I think that's the, the key: is the valuing of other people's perspectives, and, and not just the fact that they're sitting next to you. Hi, I was wondering if you have a good example of an interview question. Um, whether that's online or in person, that can get someone to feel comfortable to open up about their background without um, 
without you know violating any laws asking that, about something. That is extremely tricky. So there are very specific things you can, can and cannot ask in an interview. Uh, I steer away from that entirely. I, that's why we do all of our interviews in person. I try to get a sense of the people we're, we're interviewing uh, just, and without asking them any, any specific questions uh, that, are, that are specifically around their, their race, their gender, their, their ethnicity, or their ident identity. That's, that's really tricky to do. Um, I, I, I look for their, their background, and they, I, when they talk about their history, I can glean certain things uh, about them through, you know, uh, what, how they solved the problem, you know, where, uh, you know, any sort of challenges they have. Those type of um, issues are, uh, around um, uh, their background tend to come up in an interview when you ask kind of soft questions. But anything direct about what, you know, their, their ethnicity, their background, or their history, their religion, I, I stay away from it. I had a question coming from a large, uh, a large corporation with 80,000 people. We have a, a big diversity program uh, within our business as far as as far as the employees go. In fact, I went to some diversity events where I was, you know, being a six foot five white male married, I was the bad guy in the room. Um, but I was brought up the question there, being involved with with the Internet Project, and said, okay, how are we taking this diversity and converting it for our diverse the diverse customers that we serve, and, and the answers were just kind of like, well, we don't, we're not really doing that yet. So it, how would you recommend, I guess, using the diverse teams that we're trying to build to make a diverse experience uh, for our internet users? Uh, well, there are two ways. Do you, you guys have an employee resources group? Yes, you do. Uh, and, and the other way is, uh, what are your, um, your kind of vendor uh, outreach programs like? We, we are very, very aggressive with vendor outreach, too. I mean, we're very diverse with our vendor outreach, but again, our, our internet experience is not, is, does not reflect that. In, in which, what are your challenges specifically around? So, so we're, we're a, a big, a large retailer, yeah. but I think specifically it's our, our retail experience is, is just very <coughs> one directional. I mean, it, it's not, um, I mean, even, going as far as talking about like ADA compliance and stuff like that. There's a lot of things that we're not reaching. 20% um, of our customers are bilingual, but we don't have a bilingual, um, or 20% or of ours don't have English as a first language, mm -hmm. but we don't have a, even an option for a second language um, on the internet. So I think trying to incorporate some of that would make a big impact for our customer users in the end. So if you say you have a diverse, um, employee group and uh, it sounds like you said you're saying that they're diverse people on those teams that are creating these products if if um, they, they should be you should be encouraging those folks to uh, really have their their opinions valued if you're trying to be if you're this is how I put this. If your employee group is um, diverse um, and you're not getting to the diversity issues, then those people who are on your diverse teams are not really as valued. Their voices are not being heard or they're not encouraged to share that experience, that, that possible um, uh, impact on the, the people um, who, for whom which they identify or who which they're parts of a group of. And I would so, even go as far as to say it's those voices are being heard, but they're but it seems like too big of a task. Like, oh, that work is too hard for us to yeah, well, to implement those it, other it's languages. Gotta, it's got to be incremental. It, 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 if you if you want it to happen, you can't just say it's too hard to do. You got to start to make incremental steps. Whether it, it's you know we're for so for this iteration, we're going to try this feature set that's going to going to um, specifically target. Um, or help um, reach this segment of the market. And you do it iteratively in small steps. If, if it's a big problem, just chop, chop it down into pieces. Thank you. Hello. Um, I don't have a question. I just wanted to recommend a, uh, a resource that I came across related to the concept of idea diversity that you brought up. Sure. Um, Harvard Business Review in October released a series called The Big Idea, and their first focus was on rebel talent. And so it's talking about um, the power of constructive nonconformity. So there's a series of articles and videos and other resources, which I thought was pretty interesting, considering I used to work at Princeton University, and I had a huge issue with nonconformity there, sure. which has led me to become a solopreneur. <laughs> cheers. Um, yeah, cheers. <laughs> so um, I only lasted six months. 
But uh, I just wanted to recommend that to people as a, as a great resource to think about the value of idea diversity and that, that concept of friction. It's uncomfortable, right? But it can yield good results. Exactly. Thank you. Yeah, hi. I have a question. Um, what can someone who's interviewing at a, with an organization, is there something they can ask? And I would think this would be after you have an offer and you're considering whether to take it, probably not before that. But how can you ask to find out if that organization really is committed to all these things you're talking about, or at least some of them? Because they're all going to say they are. Well, they all you, have a written policy. You, you look at their, their record. You look at what they've done. You look at their commitment to, to diversity in their actual, the products that they produce. Are they, um, are they actively reaching into communities that are underserved? Are they, um, does their employee group look that, look, you know, diverse? Does, are there large organizations, do they have employee resource groups? Are they walking the walk as opposed to just saying, you know, talking the talk? Hey. So you have multiple, uh, or at least if, if not with just one uh, diverse team, do you have an issue picking clients that either agree with your policies or your inclusion or not? And if, if you don't, um, or let's say you do pick a client that does not agree with your policies, you say a lot, you do a lot of government work, so there are obviously like state governments that do not agree with your policies of inclusion. Now, in that scenario, does your team have a feedback of, of whether they want to participate in that project or not? Uh, I don't take those projects. I mean, there, there's some there's some states that um, let, let's let's break that down a little bit. I mean, there, the state of Pennsylvania, I can still be fired for being gay, and yeah. anywhere anywhere. There's no equal pr protection under the law for that here. here. But um, there are also there are some diversity uh, incentives within government and, and federal contracting. Um, but if there's something that, uh, there, if there's an agency or an organization that is actively discriminatory, we don't take those projects. So if you don't take those projects, um, how are you actively trying to uh, uh, gain clients that do agree with your policies? There's most people, most, the overwhelming majority of uh, commercial uh, entities that we found and most of the government agencies that we found um, consider our diversity an asset. Any other questions? Thank you very much.